Welcome to Black Cat 2015. I got a couple of quick announcements here. Uh, there's gonna be a reception tonight in the business hall at 5.30 p.m. That's located in Shoreline A. Uh, there's maps running around if you need to find out where that's at. The, uh, the Pony Awards also will take place tonight in Mandalay BCD Room at 6 p.m. Um, if you haven't already turned your phone off, please do that now. Nobody else wants to hear your ringtone, no matter how cool you think it is. And uh, you're in Jasmine Ballroom, so if that's not where you're intended to be, that's where you are. This is the session server-side template injection RCE for the modern web app with James Kettle. James? What? Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Can you hear me? Is the mic working? I can't tell from here. Okay, great. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. This is, this is server-side template injection. And you may be familiar with being so focused on exploiting a particular vulnerability that you missed something that was staring you in the face. Or with feeling tired of seeing report after report after report with nothing better than cross-site scripting in it. Or with simply really wanting to get a shell on a box. In this session, I'll introduce to you a vulnerability that can easily be mistaken for cross-site scripting, but isn't, and share with you a six-step process for hijacking template engines and getting shells on boxes. My first encounter with template injection was around 18 months ago on a client, en on a client engagement, and it was quite a stressful environment. We were all crammed into this tiny room and there was a whiteboard up with a tally of the number of shelves that each person had got within the last few weeks. I'm sure you can imagine how that felt. And the application that I was testing had some quite strange behavior. It let you customize emails that would be mass sent out to users, and these emails contained some dynamic content. So where the template that I could edit said, dear user.firstName, the, the email that the user saw would contain their actual name. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder how I can abuse this. I know what to do. I'll change it from user.firstName to user.password, and it will tell me everybody's passwords. Brilliant. So I tried that, and it failed completely. But what it did do was tell me that this input was being processed by the server as a free marker template. So I looked up the free marker template documentation and in the frequently asked questions section it said something like, is it, a safe, is it safe to allow users to submit templates if they're untrusted? And the answer it gave was no. And it went on to list all the terrible things that someone can do to your server with a malicious template. And this led me on a trail of breadcrumbs through the documentation to an exploit that got me a full shell on the server and access to a healthy amount of sensitive financial information, which was great. It was really just a one-off event though. It was quite lucky that the server made it really obvious that this input was being processed as a template. And it was also lucky that the free market documentation was so forthcoming to hackers about how dangerous it was. Nine months ago, though, at Port Swigger, we received a report that Burp Suite was failing to find a blatant cross-site scripting vulnerability, which isn't something which happens every day. So I investigated manually and found, once again, the server was behaving in quite an odd way. That's why we'd missed the cross-site scripting. And thanks to my prior encounter with template injection, I saw the issue for what it really was, which was template injection. So the client thought they had a, maybe a medium severity cross-site scripting issue on their site, but they had something that was potentially a lot more serious. This left me with a couple of questions. Exactly how common is template injection? How many times has someone found cross-site scripting and not realized that it's actually a symptom of a much more serious issue? And secondly, how serious is template injection? Is it 
only free marker that can be used to get shell on a server quite easily? Or are other template engines also quite exploitable? So I decided to investigate and got some quite interesting results that I'll share with you now. First, I'll just introduce template injection, talk about what it is, how it happens. And then I'll walk through this process for identifying and building a working exploit for whatever template engine you found in whatever environment it is. And then I'll show this process being applied to five of the most popular template engines to see how they hold up. And these engines have been selected because they show the different things that happen when you, when you apply the exploit development process to them. Then I'll demonstrate remote code execution zero days in a couple of real web applications that you may have heard of but hopefully don't have installed on your networks. And then take five minutes of questions and wrap up. What is template injection? It's simply when user input is unsafely embedded into a template like this example here. If you look at the first argument to, this, to the render function, uh, you've got user input being concatenated into this template. And that means that if the user input contains a template expression, that will be evaluated by the server. That's the core of this vulnerability. Just to be absolutely clear, this second example here is not vulnerable to, to template injection. You still have user input in the first name variable being passed into a template, but it isn't being put into the template itself, it's just being passed in as an argument. If a user were to embed a template expression inside that variable, it would just be ignored. And as with all vulnerabilities, this can happen by accident. However, I've also seen it happen through developers intentionally letting users e edit templates in quite a few different circumstances because they want to offer this functionality to users and they maybe don't realize quite how dangerous it is. On a high level, to prove that this issue is serious, first you need to find that there's some kind of template injection happening. Then you need to figure out you need to identify what the template engine in use is exactly, then simply build an exploit for it, which is where things get really involved. So how do you recognize template injection, given that there are scores of different template engines out there and they're all slightly different? Well, the way to do it is to embed a template expression and if you use something really, really simple, like seven times seven, then you've got a piece of syntax there which will be supported by almost all te template engines. So if you send that payload uh, highlighted in green and look at the output, you can tell whether it's been evaluated by the server or not. And you could just repeat this for the, for the various different common types of syntax that the template engines offer, which are listed on the bottom of the slide. There's actually a second way in which template injection can happen. The user input might not be being input directly into the template, it might be being placed inside a template expression. And this, this is even harder to spot, it often won't result in cross-site scripting because the user input is just like a variable name. And if you make any change to, to this input or any naive change, like not realizing what's going on on the server, then you'll get an error message back or you'll just get the empty string. So in order to recognize this, we need to, we need to safely close the template expression and then embed something after it. If you get input, if you don't get input reflection straight off, but you do when you try to close a template, then that suggests there's some kind of template injection happening. And then you can follow up by trying, by trying to embed simple mathematical expressions and the like. So 
Now you know there's some kind of template injection happening. How will you build an exploit for it? You can start off with a really simple payload like this that just confirms that there is some kind of evaluation happening. And then you can build a decision tree based on the behavior of different template engines. So if that 7 times 7 syntax works, we know that the server must be using one of a specific set of template engines which support that syntax, uh, one of which is Smarty. So if we send Smarty comment syntax and that payload works as well, we've confirmed that the server's running Smarty. And if that fails, then we can try some, di some different syntax, which is attuned to a different engine and so on. So using this strategy, without, without relying on something like parsing error messages that might have any kind of format, we can easily automate how to figure out exactly which template engine is in use. This is a subtree of the strategy used by Burp Suite to identify server-side template injection. So if you're a Burp Suite user, then at the end of this presentation, you'll find an update waiting for you that will automate these two steps. It will detect template injection and it will try to identify which template engine is in use. Once you know which the template engine is, things get a bit more interesting. You need to, so what you found so far is not necessarily a security issue or not necessarily more serious than cross-site scripting. What you need to prove is that you can do something uniquely evil on the server with the template. And the first key step to that is simply to read the documentation. That might sound really quite lame, but often if you read the documentation, you will find everything you need to build a fully working exploit and get a shell on the server, as we'll see shortly. The key areas of interest within the documentation are, well, the four template authors section will tell you what the basic syntax of the template is, so how to do things like loop, which is going to be really useful when you're looping around all the passwords that you've stolen from the server or whatever. If you're lucky, then the template engine will also have a security con consideration section, and this will list all of the most dangerous functions which are, which are clearly the ones that you need to pay attention to. If there isn't such a list, well, there's pretty much guaranteed to be a list of built-in functions, built-in variables, and extensions and plugins that might be enabled by default. So those make up the core attack surface. The next step is to find out exactly what you have access to within the template execution environment. Most template engines have some kind of self object and this will contain everything that's in scope so if you can find out what the name of this is and find a way to loop around the attributes and methods of this object then you can you can iteratively identify everything you've got access to some template engines don't have a self object or they don't have a documented self object but they may still have one for internal use for this use case, I've built a word list by crawling GitHub of the most popular variable names. So you can, run, you can run a word list of variable names to brute force potential variables. I've, I've released this word list in the burp intruder and it's also being added to fuzzdb, surely, it's free. Now, once you know exactly what you have access to, it's just a case of trying to exploit it which is your standard web application attack. Like you, you might be able to exploit one of any number of common vulnerabilities. It's, it's just that the way you're calling into them is slightly different. It, it's, a, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like building an exploit for PHP's unserialized function. So you may be able to call some methods. You may have access to some methods but not be able to call them unless you use other methods to get the right object references and so on. This presentation is focused on getting code execution. However, I should mention that information, the template engines are brilliant vectors for information disclosure. 
because they're being executed right in the heart of the application. They often have access to things like environment variables, which may contain really sensitive stuff like Amazon secret keys, for example. And to get access to those, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just use a loop and print out the value of all the, of all the variables. It's really, really easy. OK, so that's the theory of this exploit process. Now let's see how template engines actually hold up in real life. Firstly, free marker. So this is the one that I already mentioned. And the documentation says it lists the most dangerous functions. And one of these functions is the new function. And the documentation for it contains some uh, not that useful stuff. But the key point is that this new function can be used to create arbitrary objects provided that they implement the template, the template model interface. So let's have a look at template model and see what classes implement it. Now, that's only maybe a third, of the, a, th a third of the classes. There are quite a few. And you might find that one of these classes jumps out at you slightly. It sounds quite promising. Any ideas? Yes, exactly. Execute. I wonder what execute does. <laughs> well, it executes the show command on the server, and it gives us the output. Perfect. Exactly what we need. So here, uh, the show command is highlighted in blue. And it's really, really simple to just execute a, sh a shell command with FreeMarker on the server and get the output. Now, the brilliant thing about that is it's clearly intended functionality. It is never going to get patched. It's just, it's just sitting there as a kind of a, a trap for developers who don't read the documentation and find out how dangerous FreeMarker is. That said, you can't fault the developers of FreeMarker for not making it obvious that these are dangerous. I'm not saying this is their fault in the slightest. <coughs> OK, next up, Velocity, which is another popular Java template engine. And I found the documentation here to be a lot less forthcoming. Uh, it didn't list any, any exploitable sounding methods, and I couldn't even find a self object. So I ran a brute force with, uh, of of variable names with my word list, and I found something quite interesting. If you send the, the, the class variable, then the output from the server looks like a generic Java object. So I thought, well, that's cool. Uh, let's Google this and find out what's going on. It turns out there's an extension for velocity, which I think is not part of core velocity, but it is enabled by default and bundled with it. So that's why I didn't find it originally. And the purpose of this extension is for the use of Java reflection in templates. Now, so using a couple of methods uh, of this object, we can easily get an arbitrary Java object. And therefore, it's just a matter of taking standard one of the mill Java code to execute arbitrary shell commands and wrapping it with these, with these class methods to get references to the objects so we can call them. So this command here will simply make the server sleep for five seconds using that shell command. And we can verify that it's executed by seeing how long it takes the server to respond. Great. But what we really want is the output of the shell command, right? Uh, unfortunately, because this is Java, it takes quite a lot more code to get there. Uh, note that this isn't exactly Java. Uh, this is velocity. You, ha you have to use the syntax of whatever the template e engine is and find out like, what the velocity way of looping around something is. But anyway, once again, like, the, there's no exploits in that that weren't on the last slide. It's just a way of getting the output to, to us in a nice, easy way. And once again, we have an exploit that is pretty much using intended functionality. It isn't a really a vulnerability within velocity, although it could perhaps be better documented. This one's a bit different. 
third one, uh, Smarty is a popular PHP template engine. And by default, it's so trivial to execute arbitrary code with it that I'm not gonna talk about it. But it offers a secure mode. And the purpose of this mode is to let untrusted users edit templates. I, it's for intentionally making your application vulnerable to template in, uh, injection. And then it uses this kind of sandboxy thing to try and stop the templates from doing anything bad to the server. This is implemented using a whitelist of PHP functions. So I can't, for example, just call PHP's exec or, or system function to execute an arbitrary shell command. However, Smarty has a self object, and the self object has a method called getStreamVariable, uh, which I think is for internal use, but we can easily use it to read in an arbitrary file from the server, which is a nice start. So that command just reads in self login your, log your ID to find out the ID of the current process. Cool? Even better, Smarty lets us, in the secure mode, invoke arbitrary methods on static classes, so provided they've been imported. And Smarty, by default, imports this class called Smarty Internal Write File with a method called Write File. And what this method does is writes files, writes arbitrary contents to arbitrary locations. It can also be used to overwrite files. The only catch here is that the third argument to this method has to be of type smarty. Fortunately, we can get a handle on an object of type smarty using the clear config method of the self object. So, by chaining these two together, we can do this. The script name variable uh, is available by default and contains the location on the file system of the current PHP file. So what this does is it overwrites the current PHP file with our backdoor, easily letting us execute arbitrary shell commands on the server. So this one is pretty clearly a vulnerability with Smarty. And I, I, have, re I have reported it, and it has been fixed. But you might be thinking, well, that actually wasn't very difficult to do. And I would agree. I get the impression that with a lot of these kind of sandbox modes, these secure modes, they haven't been audited by anybody ever. So if this isn't something like Chrome Sandbox, right? So if you are going to use the, uh, the secure mode of a template language, I would say it is worth doing. It is going to make a hacker's life harder, but don't rely on it. Twig is another popular PHP template engine. And it's used by the Symfony framework, I think. And it's actually, by default, more secure than Smarty's secure mode. So in addition to there being a whitelist of PHP functions, uh, we can't Im invoke any static methods. And we also can't get object references out of functions because they just get battered into a string. However, as ever, there is a self object. I think this one isn't actually documented anywhere, but you can find it with a variable named brute forcing. And this doesn't have any directly exploitable methods, but it does have an attribute called env, which is an instance of twig environment. And twig environment has some quite cool methods, such as one of them, which contains a call to PHP's call user func, uh, which is a built-in PHP function where if you control the arguments to it, you can invoke arbitrary functions with arbitrary arguments. And here, the name variable, which is the argument to the function, is being passed in as a parameter to that function. So we, we, we have control over that. The callback variable comes from the filter callbacks attribute of this object, which we can set using the register undefined callback method. So once again, by combining two methods, chaining them onto each other, we can call one method to set that attribute, and then call the next method, and then call the other method to invoke the call user func with, with exec and ID, and execute arbitrary shell commands on the server. And once again, this isn't this one, 
is not really intended functionality, or it doesn't look like it, right? Uh, but I wouldn't say this is a vulnerability in Twig. Because Twig actually has a sandbox mode for the sole purpose of letting users submit untrusted templates. And this is where things get really quite tricky. So in addition to all the previous restrictions, we've also got, we also can't retrieve attributes. So I, I, can, I can no longer get hold of self.env. And there's a whitelist of method calls. So even if a d developer passes in an object with a vulnerable method, we can't invoke that method on that object unless it's been whitelisted. That might sound like you can't get anywhere, right? That's what I thought at first. However, when I read the code that implements the whitelist, I found a bit of a flaw right at the start of it. So actually, we can call arbitrary methods on any object that implements one of these two interfaces, right? And guess what implements one of these two interfaces? The self object. So we can call arbitrary methods on the self, of, on the, on the self object, which is quite nice. And now, I, as I said, the self object doesn't have any directly exploitable methods. But it does have this one method for internal use only, uh, which contains a line which, which contains this call whatever the block variable method is on whatever the template object is. So if we control these variables, which we do because they all come from the argument, we can use this method as a proxy or a gadget of sorts to, to invoke arbitrary methods on any object that we can get a, a reference to. So here, uh, the user has passed in, uh, I mean, the developer has passed in an object called dev object with a method called vulnerable method. And we can't call it directly, but using this method as a proxy, we can invoke that argument. We can evoke that method, which, is, which could be quite nice. Now, you might have noticed that I haven't got a shell here, actually. Uh, that's because, by default, Twig doesn't offer any references to, to exploitable objects. However, developers can pass in objects and will pass in objects to, to templates, and they may have methods which are vulnerable to all your standard uh, attacks. Something worth noting here is that different instances of template injection within a single application may have different objects passed in, so it's worth auditing all of them until you get code execution. OK, finally, this one's a bit different. This is CodePen, a publicly accessible website which, by design, lets users submit templates in a variety of different languages. Now, I've chosen the Jade language, uh, because why not? And you can see the input up the top and then the output from the server in white down the bottom. And you can easily see you've got cross-site scripting, uh, but they've actually mitigated that using a sandbox domain, so you can't do anything bad with that. You can also confirm you can execute commands on, you can execute mathematical expressions on, on the server pretty easily. So now it's just a matter of following the exploit process, but in this case, it's a, a completely black box thing. So Jade's a Node.js template engine, and I didn't really know, I don't know Node.js. It's just this is how you do it with having no idea what's going on. So first off, you find the, the, the self object. In this case, it's called root. And then you find a way to loop around this object and find out all of the attributes and methods. And then you just kind of go hunting for interesting sounding things. And eventually, I ran into this, which is quite promising, really. So CodePen has recognized that I'm trying to do something that might do bad things to their server. Cool, OK. Uh, but they've blocked it. However, if you look carefully at the phrasing of this uh, warning, you might have a suspicion that this defense is implemented with a regular expression. And it actually is. So all we have to do 
is take that top line, which is, what's, which is what has triggered this method, and split it into two statements. OK. So this executes exactly the same command on the server. Wonderful. So now I've got access to require, so I can import external module things which can be used to execute shell commands on the server. All right. So I couldn't get the output of this shell command because Node is asynchronous and I don't understand asynchronous things. Uh, but so what this does is it executes ID and it pipes the output of that to my server with Netcat. So you can, you, you can see the output on, on the bottom half. Cool. OK. I think I've answered the question, how serious is template injection, right? It's, it can often be used to get a shell on the server. Not always, but within pretty much any template engine, depending on what developer objects are passed in, you might find that they've introduced a code execution vulnerability. So now that leaves the question of exactly how common template injection is, right? And the true answer is I don't know for certain, right? But what I do know is I've run into quite a few and it's quite easy to miss and I've had no trouble finding a couple of applications to demonstrate zero days in for you. So, this is Alfresco, which is a content management system. And the great thing about this content management system is that it implements some of the pages using free market templates, which you can see here, right? However, I'm a, as a low privilege user here, because you might as well start from as low privilege as possible. Uh, I'm not allowed to edit this template. So this template makes this page, but I can't edit it. However, administrators can edit that page. And in Alfresco, there's, I found, quite a serious stored cross-site scripting vulnerability in the comment system. So that's the cross-site scripting payload that I've used there. Uh, it isn't that relevant, but so Alfresco tries to allow safe HTML and they allow the image tag and they think that this is an attribute with a name of the empty string, right? But what a browser sees is an image tag, some random crap, closing tag, and then an SVG thing with an event handler and executes it, right? And this is the free marker backdoor that I want the administrator to inject for me. So, all I have to do is write some JavaScript that does some cross-site request forgery to overwrite that file that I showed with the, with the back door. So it looks kind of messy, but all it does is grab the user's cross-site request forgery token and then uses it to make a same origin request to inject the back door, right? Great. And when encoded, it looks like that. So let's look at what happens when an administrator views a page with a comment on it with this payload in. So this just does alert one, and this has the full payload. Now, we shouldn't see anything out of the ordinary, right? Blank document, uh, there's like a random character down there. I'm not sure how it got there, but whatever, nothing much. But now, if as the low privilege user, I look at what the contents of this file are, I see, oh, look, my back door's there. All right, so all I've got to do is put like a nice shell command here, and we've got the output. All right, cool. It's worth mentioning, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I spotted something interesting in the Alfresco documentation when I was trying to get the server working actually. It says the Linux installer uh, may decide to disable SE Linux system-wide permanently when you run it. So that's another bonus, I guess. Uh, I should also mention Alfresco isn't an application like WordPress where any old admin can, can easily execute arbitrary code, right? There were, I couldn't find any other ways to execute arbitrary code from being an administrator. 
and Alfresco is available as a cloud service, which suggests the same thing. Okay, cool. This server goes down randomly. Yeah, right, okay. This server goes down randomly, but I have a countermeasure. All right, this is XWiki. You might have heard of this one. Uh, it's one of the most popular media, it's one of the most popular wiki applications after MediaWiki, I think, and it's quite feature heavy. The great thing about XWiki is anyone who encounters, like by default, anyone can just run up and register their own account on it. All you need is access to it, and you can register an account. Obviously, it won't have very many, very many privileges. So I'm doing everything here with a self-registered account. And if we edit it any old page, we quickly see that it might support velocity. And we've got a payload for velocity. So let's see what happens. Hopefully it won't go down. Okay, so it's failed. And that's because the class variable has been quite wisely removed by the XWiki De de developers, so there's no uh, Java reflection available, unfortunately. So what's left to do but to read the documentation? Well, the key things about Velocity are it doesn't require special privileges. Anyone can run it, but it's run inside a sandbox with only access to safe objects. Right, cool, sounds promising. And also, there are some other scripting languages, but you need programming rights to execute them, but they're not sandboxed. So let me show you what I mean. So this is a nice Python backdoor. And I can try to inject this, but because I don't have privileges, it fails, right? Because I don't have programming rights. So let's have a look at these safe APIs that we've got access to. Right, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, they're really enormous. There's tons and tons of stuff. And the first cool thing that I found is there's this document class which refers to the current document. So using a method of this document, you can make a wiki page, make an edit to itself, and then save it. And there's something quite interesting here. You might notice it yourself. Uh, there's a method called save. And there's another method called save as author, bearing in mind that the author of a wiki page is the last person who edited it, in other words, me. So the presence of the save as author method makes me wonder who the save method might save as. Perhaps it's the user who's currently viewing the document. In fact, perhaps it gets the privileges of the user who's currently viewing the document. So what I've done here is taken my nice Python backdoor and I've wrapped it in some velocity which says, does the user viewing this page have programming rights? If they do, okay, cool. Now get them to inject this backdoor and save it. So, let's just drop this into place and see what happens. Okay, so nothing's happening there because I'm viewing it, I, I, don't have, I don't have programming rights. But if a user, if an admin happens to view this page, which because I've edited the home page uh, is gonna happen pretty promptly, I think, they don't see anything out of the ordinary either. But now my back door has been injected by them, unknowingly. So if I happen to put a shell command here, then, and wait for a bit, then, drum roll, yeah, all right, we've got a shell on the server. <laughs> cool. Okay, so far, I've been kind of a little bit focused on the offense side, slightly. So let's have a look at 
what to do if your application has to let users edit templates. Say it's a business requirement, right? The core defense is simplicity. It's using a really simple template engine. Something like, uh, like Mustache or Python's built-in template. Something that basically just does variable substitution is going to offer very little attack surface. It will be really hard to hack. OK, let's, if you have to offer something a bit more advanced than that, well, you're going you're gonna to have a fun time. But you can, minimize the, you can minimize the attack surface by using a sandbox mode if one is available, thoroughly reading the documentation to find out if there's any like secret third-party plugins that really code execution really easy. Uh, and yeah, only pass in the minimum number of attributes, the minimum objects, like just pass in the exact data you need the template to have. One method that I've seen used quite effectively, as far as I could tell, is the approach used by MediaWiki and thus Wikipedia. So Wikipedia actually lets you embed arbitrary lure code in wiki pages, which is something I had no idea of over, and I had a little bit of a celebration when I found out. Uh, but actually, this lure is executed inside a really heavily sandboxed environment. So, like, on the API level, all the, all the methods and modules that could be used to do anything dangerous have just been removed. So it's actually really hard to do something bad with MediaWiki's sandbox lure, even though you can do quite a few things. Uh, I say that not just because I've failed to hack it, but because as far as I know, no one else has got a show on Wikipedia recently. If you're code pen, then you need to allow quite a few different template engines, and it might not really be feasible to manually sandbox each individual one. So what you can fall back to then, which is what they've done, is, using, is, is sandboxing the operating system environment, using something like Docker and then heavily locking it down, so using things like kernel capabilities to prevent the, the, the template from doing things like opening any file handles or accessing the network or and like turning off set uh, set UID and making the file system read read only and so on so by combining loads of measures like that you can make a sandbox that's maybe not impossible to break out of uh, but it's certainly a huge amount of work please don't think that I'm saying you should just put something in Docker and then forget about it without doing any configuration, because that won't get you very far. OK, now I've got five minutes for questions, I believe. Could you go back to your slides to like the seven or eight common variables? Oh, uh, so that's part of a word list of 2,000 variable names, uh, which is available in Burp Suite in both versions and it will and I've submitted it to FuzzDB but they haven't released it yet so that word list is very much uh, is, 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 is very much available yeah does that answer your question cool okay I'm going to wrap up in several minutes after these questions okay cool yeah so you said the check is available in Burp Suite is it yep. available in the other big players, or will it be? Uh, I expect it will be fairly soon. Uh, I've, I've showed how to automate it. It isn't that difficult. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right. Great. So the key things to remember are template engines are server-side sandboxes. If you view them as that, you realize how challenging it is to make a template engine that actually holds up. Template injection is there if you look for it and read, explore, attack. Finally, I'm, uh, I'll be at the back for more questions. Uh, or you can send me an email. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Thank you for listening.